not, it's body armour, because somewhere, somewhere around the 70s, the Russians actually thought, do you know what, it might be a good idea if we gave our lads some no, body armour and uh, not just treat them as completely disposable. Oh, no. Hi, welcome back to Airsoft Action TV. I'm Tom Anvil Hibbert. And I'm Gareth Gadge Harvey. And today we're going to talk about the history of the AK. And we've got a variety of our own guns, and we'll, if we don't have one, We'll show it along the bottom somewhere as so, we talk about it. Yeah, we're just going to look at Kalashnikovs through the ages and uh, their pros, cons and uh, service history. So Tom, you were telling me that uh, what I've always thought was my trusty Tokyo <laughs> Ruri AK-47 is not actually an AK-47. It's, it's not an AK-47 gauge. No? Well no. I bought this and it was sold as yeah. one. No, well, they always, well they always are and, and in the West they're pretty much, they've always been called AK-47s, but to the Russian government this was actually an AK-49. Right, so this is a modernised version of the original AK-47? Well, what happened is, the original AK-47 was a stamped steel receiver, yeah. a bit like the SGG-44, but they, whilst they could manufacture them, the quality control in the factory meant that they weren't consistent enough for mass production. So they went to a, a forged, so a big, big drop forging, made, made a big billet of steel, and then machined receiver, which was the Type 2, which is Type 2 known in the West. That went through another round of modernisation procedures, and you got to the Type 3. Which so this is, known to the West as an AK-47 Type 3, known, known even to the Russian government at the time as an AK-49. So, if we go back, from my understanding, in World War II, I think the Russians realised that the PPSH submachine gun was critical, and entire platoons had them. Yep. And at the same time, the Germans were mucking around with what we call an intermediate cartridge, because before then you had little diddy 9mm or whatever submachine gun uh, or pistol rounds, and you had full bore 303 type rifle cartridges. Now, most combat engagements were actually happening at 400, 500 metres, not the mile that a 303 round yeah, hit some of So, <clears throat> while the Russians were experimenting with a few semi automatic and automatic rifles, it wasn't till post war when I believe. Mikhail Kalashnikov, who used to be a tank driver, I think, or something. Yeah, like you never quite know with Soviet propaganda yeah. how it happened, but he certainly had an aptitude for mechanical things. And I think he applied his design for a revolutionary new submachine gun or assault rifle, and I think he failed the first couple of times, but yeah. eventually they said, yeah, we'll try this one. Yeah, it's, very, it's pretty complicated. Um, Ian from Forgotten Weapons YouTube channel has got a series of videos on the development of the AK that are really good. Um, this is basically, a comp the AK was a complete mashup. It's on the, it's, it's the locking system in it, it's from a Garand. Really? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and then the long straight gas system is from a Tokarev. Yeah. So it's a complete mashup of various weapons. But I mean, systems. mechanically inside, it's got very few working parts yeah. compared to a lot of us. As I'm aware, there's, a, there's like the sear, there's the return spring, there's the bolt carrier, and that's probably about it, isn't it? And there's obviously your gas bars to cycle them. Yeah. Here. But as you talked about, Gadge, originally it was pretty much. A replacement for the submachine gun in Russian service. It wasn't really designed as a, as a long-range rifleman's weapon. It was a get up close and personal between 100, 200 metres and let rip. The SKS semi-automatic carbine was in service at the same time. And I've uh, fired an SKS which uses the same 7.62 Soviet round, and my shoulder still knows about it. Um, but yeah, they, they were side by side for a while. They were, really. and then they realised that the SKS was at that point completely pointless, and. Um, Went, went to the AK, family of weapons. So if we just look at the ergonomics of, uh, the, we'll call this for the sake of argument, because I'm so used to it, an AK-47. I know Tom will probably die a little inside there, but uh, ergonomically, it's got a full stop. Now, back in the day when I bought this for airsoft, and I bought this around about 2002, and it still works, uh, that large stock, which would give you more stability when firing for a normal infantryman, would be great for a large battery. Large batteries. Uh, the magazines had huge high caps and high caps to the raids, they were like 600 round high caps compared to the 300 you get in most of the guns. Yep. And they're a bit long, there were problems that when you were trying to fire and you were prone with a magazine attached, as you can see you can't get much more lower than that really. It's actually dig a little hole. Yeah. And uh, I really liked them, originally I hated the AK so I always thought it was a bit of a terrorist weapon or sort of <laughs> like, you know. Uh, it just had a bit of a stigma. It was the thing that when I was a kid you saw the IRA using, etc. Yeah, true. All, all the bad true. guys in films had AKs. Which is now why we like them. Yeah, kind of. But when we went to play a Sterling Services game a long time ago, uh, we all went as, um, I think, Cuban mercenaries or something like that. So we all bought AKs for it. And since then, I've been a bit of an Ooh. AK convert. I think the biggest change, though, for most people used to M4 ARs is the fire selector. Because in most NATO weapons, the fire selector normally starts off in safe goes to semi and then goes to full auto. Now with an AK, 
The fire selector here also doubles as a dust cover. So when you put it into its first setting, which would normally be semi-automatic on most weapons, that's actually full auto, and that allows you to chamber around fully on a real model. Swipe it all the way down, it's single shots. Now for a long time, we always believed in the West, and some people still do, that this is a doctrinal thing, that Soviet riflemen were trained to put high volumes of fire down, not to worry about single shot unless they were very low on ammo, yeah. and the actual shots are taken by a Dragunov uh, operator. But Tom, you've uh, read stuff that... I've read, yeah, there. not so much disputes, but it was stories from riflemen training, but it may have been later on in the Soviet system when they got a bit more into more aimed fire. And actually, the weapon was designed, so they were they were maintaining. I'm not saying this is true. You can always please leave us a comment if it's that actually it's done. So you sweep down to semi with one simple movement, and then you could deliberately come back up to full auto. Now again, that's just that was that was from stuff from some guys that trained in the 70s, 80s. It does make sense if you consider that unless you're actually fighting very close to BMP, which was doctrine, most Soviet riflemen were carrying three or four magazines of 30 rounds, which isn't, if you're firing on full auto all the time, you can sustain a firefighter for about five minutes. Yeah, but, but that was kind of what they were used for. Yeah. So this, this weapon was then replaced by our next one, the AKM. So I've been an AK fan since I bought that AK-47, and the one thing I've been missing for a long time is an AKMS, um, well an AKM, and this is an AKMS, S denoting that it has a folding stock. And um, this is obviously an improvement from that original model we showed you later, but weirdly it's had an incredibly long service life. Uh, these came into service in like the, what? 1957, early, yeah, early, early mid-50s, and you can still see them being used by Russian Special Forces and Russian Militia Units today, pretty yeah. much. So Tom, tell me about the differences. The biggest difference with the AKM and the AKMS over the original AK was that they went from a forged and milled receiver to a stamped steel receiver. So as we said before, the forged receiver, you start off with a semi-molten lump of metal which is whacked by a big shaped hammer and then they use a milling machine to, to cut away the material afterwards. With the stamping, it's a thin sheet of material which is then pressed by a great big tool in, and puts all the bends and cuts and folds in it. So much like, just like every single panel on your car, your washing machine sides, all of that thin metal is done in exactly the same way. But it's actually quite a difficult procedure to do correctly and to do efficiently and to get the consistency. It took them 10 years to perfect the process. Now looking at this, I think about it as well, like um, originally I remember reading that the first AK series had a tendency to move upwards and climb to the right when you fired them. So they've shaped the muzzle brake with a defect yeah. that pushes a lot of the energy well, upwards so, and yeah. that way to push it so back down, down, again. down and left again. Yeah, which has seemed quite a nice thing. Now, I've just recently bought this one from Fire Support, and to me, it looks like a real AK. I it's mean, rude. compared to the Tokyo Maru, I'm not, not, not knocking Maru, because like, it's 15 years old, and they didn't make things in metal bodies, but the actual build quality of this is phenomenal. That's fantastic, um, isn't it? I mean, I got it out of the box, and I was just like, wow, that is fantastic. Well, the wood's really nice. So, the, what you get in a lot of airsoft replicas is the wood is kind of machined from a single piece of pine. Whereas on these ones, they've done it from the, the actual laminate, actual right, yeah. laminate plywood, yeah, which is really nice. Um, because in cross section, you would actually see all those individual levels. In fact, you sort, sort of can if you look there. You can, we'll, yeah. We'll show you a close we'll up in a moment. Um, uh, the receiver is a stamping, just yeah. like it should be. It's not a nickel die casting. Or and I know it's even got its individual serial number underneath, hasn't it? It I mean, does, yeah. I mean, which is which is lovely, you know. I mean, LCT have been brilliant. They've actually got Ismash factory trademarks and a fake serial number of production date, etc., on it. Now. Because I'm a reenactor as well as an airsoft, I bought loads of add-ons for these sort of things. So one thing I will show you, which is quite interesting while we're here, is the AKM's bayonet. Now the bayonet's the AKM, would just slide on, excuse me a second while I do that. Slides under the barrel, locks into a lug. I'm not going to do it right now because I really want to fix the bayonet to an airsoft weapon. And then you've got your normal pretty standard fighting bayonet. Now what the clever thing with these is, as well as having a saw blade for sort of survival purposes or whatever, you can also clip scabbard and the bayonet together and it makes a pair of wipers. Now because the Russians expected some sentry wires to be electrified and this bit's metal they put a little rubber handhold there so you don't get shocked. With this being Bakelite this doesn't conduct electricity either so you could with a minimal amount of risk cut yep. through a light wire which is a nifty kind of and compared to most military bayonets, it's actually not bad as not a bad. You could probably survival. fight with that as a fighting knife, fighting knife survival, survival knife. knife, yeah, it's yeah. pretty good. It's quite sturdy, cross sectional. So I believe you also on your person, Gaz, you have a 
a real AK magazine. I do. With yes. Some inert. Uh, now, I know inert. Seven yeah. seven point six two. This is a actually East German um, AKM magazine. Now originally AK magazines had flat sides on them, uh, but as most engineers will know, putting this ribbing in actually means you can have more strength for a thinner material. Yeah, they, yeah, they made up went too much thinner so, gauge. So these, it's a thirty round magazine. I've only loaded this with about eight rounds at the moment, um, and it still weighs a ton to be honest. And that, I'm going to show you a close up of this, is a 7.62 Soviet um, intermediate cartridge. And I think so they're much shorter than the big four pound rifle ones. They're also shorter than the NATO 7.62. Okay, so um, they're not, they're not, and there's contrary to popular belief, they're not cross compatible, so you no. can't put a 7.62 NATO into an AK and, and the reverse. Now, if you notice, one interesting thing is that I quite like this. The Soviets um, painted the cartridge colour so you don't have all that shiny brass. So if you're actually in a firing position and you unload and empty cartridges everywhere, you don't have that giveaway glint. Yeah, a lot of people well, use them. Um, these, a lot of these steel, so they need to lacquer them. Yeah, because brass was quite expensive. Well, you can actually see it steel there. Can't yeah. Again, we're all yeah. close upon these rounds. But that's a big round. It's got a bit of a kick. Like I said, I've actually fired this particular round in different rifles while on ranges in Canada. And uh, yeah, you know you're firing it. It's not like firing a 5.56 with a gentle tap on the shoulder. It's, yeah. it's a sufficient kick. But um, well, part of the reason the Russian army is still using them, particularly special forces guys, is for barrier penetration. So a big old heavy bullet punches through bricks and mud huts and everything way, way better than the more modern rounds. Now another accessory they made for the, uh, the AKM and the AKMS was the PBS-1 suppressor. A lot of people call these silencers, they don't silence a weapon, they suppress them. And essentially you take the original barrel blast deflector, sort of muzzle break off, yeah. screw this on and it will deaden the noise of your shots for the first couple. It's essentially a series of rubber rings inside oh, the suppressor. Bad? Okay, was it a white yeah. system in there? Yeah, and they basically will wear down with yeah. prolonged use. You can replace them, etc. This is obviously an airsoft one. I don't own a real suppressor because I live in the UK and it's kind of frowned upon. And that really is my... Oh, I haven't had a chance to test fire this yet, but uh, if it's from fire support and LCT, I've got great faith in it and I'm sure it will do us proud. Okay, so the next, the next thing we can look at is the AK-74. So this is um, an LCT uh, AK-74SN, believe it or not, from fire support. We'll tell you what those numbers mean again, letters mean again in a second. Uh, um, AK-74N... SN, sorry, has been my weapon of choice for ages. Tom, you decided to splash out on one? Yeah, I've just got a new one. Um, I was very envious of Gadget's E&L. Uh, but I've got an LCT, because I'm really familiar, I've already got an LCT. So I, I that honestly really can't sensitive. see any difference in them, to be honest. Between, for me, they're equally good quality, like Airsoft AEGs. Um, as we mentioned earlier with the AKM, S, S is for a folding stock, but instead of having the underfolder stock that you have on a AKM, you've got, really when we do it, a really stiff, stiff it's a really new triangular folding stock that locks into the side, uh, which is a little bit more, more rigid. It's really handy for yeah. going to games in, you can just shove it in your bag, yeah. which is one of the reasons, part of the reason I got the folding stock version is. And the end with. part of the designation is because Do the same again. The Russians started understanding we needed night vision, they needed different scopes, so this side rail here is kind of bolted onto the side of the receiver. Early AK-74s don't have it, in fact most real AK-74s don't have it, same as the AKM S we have doesn't have it. Uh, now, that's most airsoft ones seem to though. Yeah, no, cause that's because airsoft is love rails. Now you can put an, actually a 20mm rail mount on the side there if you wanted to, but in reality it was for scopes like this PSO. Uh, and this actually fits on my Dragonov, but we'll just see if it actually fits on here as well. Um, yeah, pretty much. Well, I'm we'll not going to force the issue. But we'll get it on. But as you can see, then you can put an optic onto the side of an assault rifle. Uh, I've even seen people using the optic off RPG-7s on the side of rifles in actual footage, you know, from Russian and Soviet use. Well, the bit, so what, Gatch, there was one major difference when they introduced this rifle. Which okay. was... The calibre, I'd imagine. The calibre of the, the, calibre of the, of the round. And funnily enough, I think we've got some of those here. So they went from a 7.62 that's 5.45. So this this was largely a result of uh, the Russian or the Soviet government's observations of events in Vietnam and the Americans' introduction of the M16 and the 5.56. Which had swapped from a 7.62 NATO in the M14 to a higher velocity but lighter 5.56 
round for the answer. And largely they went, they went for that purely because for a conscript army, a faster, lighter bullet is easier to make hits with than a heavier, yeah. slower bullet. And you can carry more of them. Yeah, well there you go, easy to make hits I with. I mean, you can just see there the difference between the two. They're actually about the same length, but yeah, there's obviously a lot less propellant than that, but it's, it's almost like a needle compared to that. Yeah, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? Now, one thing in Afghanistan, the Mujahideen thought the Soviets had poisoned their bullets because when a 7.62 would hit them, it would cause a big entry wound, so a normal entry wound and a big exit wound, in roughly the same sort of area, they could figure that out. The through and through. Yeah, with their limited medical skills they had at the time, and also understanding, I'm not trying to be insulting to the Afghan people at all, but most of the guys in the Mujahideen were not educated in this way, these rounds would hit you at one point and disintegrate or tumble and come out, like they could hit you at the collarbone and come out of your head. Yeah, it's the same thing with 5.56, yeah. 5.56 five, 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 going really fast, yours and, and disintegrate. And it created a lot of internal injury that they just didn't understand and couldn't treat. So when people started getting gangrene or septicemia and dying in agony, they assumed that the Russians were using some sort of chemical bullet, which wasn't true, it was just a very high velocity round. Yeah. And if we look at these two rounds very quickly, Tom, you can actually feel that, I mean, they're comparatively loaded, if I just hold that for you, you can feel the difference between those two. Yeah, that's, this yeah. metal one's significantly more heavy. Yeah, I mean, so that's, a, that's a Bakelite, I call, they're called plum, it's almost black. Bakelite magazine, lighter rounds, metal magazine, heavier rounds. It's not exactly rocket science, so you can carry a lot more of this than you can of this. So this is a really nice replica, Judge. Um, I guess same thing again with yours, the wood's brilliant, the metal's really nice, nice heavy gauge. One thing they got really, really right on this one is actually the, the muzzle brake. The muzzle brake's lovely on it, isn't yeah, it? Well, yeah, it's it's about right for the year of production. I had a yeah. little Google earlier. I'm not, I'm not a weapons expert. All the little drilled in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. So it's it's really nice. Again, I haven't had a haven't had a go on this yet, but so we're looking forward to getting out and playing. Now, with one thing I always love about any form of Kalashnikov, like real or airsoft, is that this um, the iron sights on them. It's a nice little ladder sort of sight that you kind of like there. Just move from. Battle site to a very optimistic, very optimistic. thousand meters. Right now, given that when I was an infantryman, I was firing an, uh, an SA80 or L85 individual weapon, and with a suit on, I was only expected to hit things four or five hundred meters away. Yeah, like hitting something a thousand meters away with a, uh, a, 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 a sort of low tolerance AK is well, it's it's ambitious. Well, they're say. in the right hands. They're no they're no more or less accurate than than the AR series. But doctrinally, they tend to leave it on the little end, the little end yeah. lock, which is the, which is basically the 300 yard battle sight range. And they're trained that's for actually, and they're that's trained. actually a P, you know. It's actually a P with, on the P. <laughs> so they're trained to leave it on the P and just aim at the belt buckle of the opponent. And yeah. at distances closer than 300, it will hit higher, and at 300 or 400, it will hit. I think it's a P actually, my Cyrillic's well out of the If I'm wrong, leave a comment uh, and tell uh, me. Yeah, no. um, uh, but there's a few more guns we're going to show you. So there the, is. But before we before do that, that, one thing I want to mention, we almost forgot about it there. Afghanistan was the first time the West saw that in combat, and the Soviet army had to change its way of fighting completely. They weren't fighting an armoured battle on the plains of West Germany, they were fighting a counterinsurgency war in the mountains, being shot at from ambush. It became a platoon leader's war rather than a sort of like you know, brigade kind of war. And one of the most useful things they could have in a session was a GP25 Kostyol, which is Russian for bonfire, grenade launcher. Pretty much a Russian version of the M203 that had been used in Vietnam. Uh, 40mm grenade, I believe. Um, just slides under the barrel. Again, we won't try and clip it onto it because they're buggers for scrap <laughs> the way work and they need a bit of work before they'll fit you. Not that I might, but. Whichever one you've got. But it's one of the things with that, and I've used one in airsoft games before, it makes the AK tremendously front heavy. Yeah, yeah. And in airsoft, I find actually the benefits of having a shower grenade attached to it. Compared to in woodland, in woodland is pointless. If I was going to fire tag rounds at a proper milsim, I'd probably consider it. I'm, I'm, I'm considering getting GP25 to fire tag yeah. rounds. And again, you've got your little sights here that you set for the amount of range. And nicely, as you actually, I'll just yeah, most people it. just take those off. Uh, I'm not sure, but as you actually move that, it actually changes that little rear leaf sight, comes up and down, yeah. and that goes in and out. So you can actually work out exactly what sort of elevation you need to fire a shot off. Obviously, with airsoft weapons, that's <laughs> but we like gubbins like that that work. And the last thing we'll mention about this, yeah. because the next gun doesn't take it, the bayonet for the AK-74, pretty familiar to any AK user before. The big difference is, rather than having a metal scabbard, All right. they made it out of Bakelite as well. Yeah. See this one made by Ismash. I think this one even has matching serial numbers, you can see. No, that's quite rare. There and there. Yeah, so the actual scabbard, uh, yeah. Those, those two numbers match. Well, that's again, actually quite rare, quite, quite, quite rare yeah. collected. And again, all you've got to do is clip together the two parts, and you've got an insulated wire cutter. 
Now, most air stop replicas won't actually accept a bayonet for very sensible reasons. I think that's kind of on purpose. <laughs> I know that my ENL won't accept a real bayonet. Um, that we've just found out. Will, but it won't lock in. Again, that's quite sensible. Because we don't really want you running around stabbing each other. No, if you're a reenactor, then do you know what? The times you actually fix bayonets and reenactment are only for photo purposes anyway. So it doesn't, really it doesn't lock, it doesn't matter. But the AK74. But Great. Still, still going to this day. Yes. In a different, in a, yeah, in been modified slightly. However, if I was in a tank or a helicopter, I'd probably want something a bit smaller than what? that. A bit like this, guys. This is the AK74SU, which stands for shortened with the U and S for the folding stock. So you see quite a lot of these in airsoft, but the reality yeah. is. They really weren't used that widely. No. I mean, they're originally designed as a carbine for airborne forces, special forces, but they found actually the performance on them wasn't as good as the 74. So you pretty much see them really with like Russian militia police units, yeah. um, occasionally tank crew. Tank crew definitely had them. Helicopter during... pilots in Afghanistan were quite. Yeah. Used to take them up and stick them behind their seats. Now, what's quite interesting, you've got rather than having that ladder type site we mentioned yeah. earlier, you've got this fixed site that essentially has two settings, which is point blank and about 100 meters. Actually, it makes more sense, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Again, you've got a sight rail on the side of it, as we mentioned before. Same triangle folder stock. Yeah. Now, this is a model by ENL, and ENL make phenomenal AK replicas. If you're going to buy a AK replica, get an LCT or an ENL. They're about, they're comparable, in my opinion. Uh, but this is actually beautifully made. The ENLs are probably more accurate. But with that comes another problem, that they actually rust more accurately. Yeah, that's true. I've got an ENL AK74, and if I don't apply a light coating of um, weapons oil every now and then with a bit of a uh, soft cloth. I can get surface rust sometimes if I'm not careful. Now the thing with these, and Tom will explain it better, is that they've got this, people think it's some sort of spray, that's actually an expansion chamber isn't it? Yeah, it's the barrel's so short that there's not enough time for gas to put to pressure on the through. working parts, so what that's got is an expansion chamber in, the, in that big, in the big flash hider, which puts back pressure down the barrel to then to, to drive the working parts, so they don't, they sort of function really badly with it taken off. 